are not certain of, we're not certain of our technology, but uh, we're very pleased to interview George Berry, just for the record, on uh, July 26, 2011. And uh, we'll begin by sort of getting on the record some of your public contributions to the development of the city. You were commissioner of the airport for many years, is that right? I was. Uh, that's not how I started out in okay. city government. I, uh, I started out on, in 1962, perhaps at the lowest rung possible in city government. I was a tax clerk for the Board of Tax Assessors and uh, was fortunate enough to transfer after a year to the Department of Finance. and. Uh, in that connection, uh, because the city of Atlanta has a centralized finance operation, I was able to learn a lot about every department of the city government and and then uh, worked in the mayor's office and then finally at the airport. Okay. And which mayor were you working under? I worked for four mayors. Four mayors, my goodness. Yes, I worked for Mayor Allen and Mayor Massell. Mayor Jackson and Mayor Young. So when you first came in, it was under. So yeah. did you come? What you went to Young Harris? Or? I did. I grew up in the small town of Blairsville, Georgia, up in the mountains, uh, right on the North Carolina Georgia border, and uh, went to the public schools there, and then went to Young Harris College. It was a junior college, two-year college, and. Uh, and after leaving Young Harris, I went in the military. And uh, when I came out of the military, I was still in the reserves and uh, had started my life in Blairsville, Georgia, hoping to, to live there and make a living there. And in 1961, the Berlin Wall was built. And uh, I've always assumed that uh, President Kennedy and Secretary of Defense McNamara and others were sitting around one day saying, what can we do to show an American response to this event? And some bright idea in the crowd said, let's call up the reserves. <laughs> and I had to liquidate the little business that I had started. I had to upend my life. And it was nothing more than a gesture. I was not in back in the reserves, back in on active duty for but just a matter of months and was turned loose or discharged, if you will, from active duty in uh, the, the early 1962. And I found myself at loose ends and uh, decided that if I were to ever have a chance before I went back to Blairsville and restarted my life, that it, I should get my degree, my bachelor's degree. And uh, I uh, often tell the story that I, that, uh, I tried to go to the University of Georgia and found that it didn't have enough money to go there. And, and you couldn't get a job at that time in Athens. Students were working for a dollar an hour, basically. And uh, so I transferred over to Atlanta and uh, I was intimidated about Atlanta. I, was, I had never driven in downtown Atlanta, but I had been to the airport. Mm -hmm. So I went to the airport with a handful of dimes, which you could make a phone call in those days and uh, went into the lobby of the old terminal and uh, one of the ads in the paper that day was for the city of Atlanta mm -hmm. and uh, so I called and and the job that they offered me was a tax clerk in the tax assessors where I dealt with delinquent payers of automobile taxes and uh, that's how, I, that's how I became employed with the city. And rather than going back to Blairsville, you know, 
10 years passed and then another 10 years <laughs> passed. And, so what was and, the airport like? Because this was not even the airport with the blue. It was the airport it with was, the blue, it yes. Was the, blue. Uh, the earlier, the earlier so it terminal that finished. you might remember is the yeah. the old World War II Quonset hut that was there, which yeah. was preceded the right. terminal that opened in May of 1961. 1961. Okay, so, so it, it had was, just opened. It had just opened, yeah. and it was built to last generations. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, I, I, I remember now that I went to my first meeting talking about the fact that we were going to have to do something in uh, the mid-60s. So it lasted about four years before we had to start talking about expansion. The, the jets came in. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Boeing 707 came into service and it turned airport planning on its head. and So we had to begin planning for a new, a, a new facility and I was involved in that from the start and that was the reason why I wound up my service with the city. Uh, at the airport. So how did you get involved from being a tax in the finance office to being involved in, in the in looking at the the, the challenges at the airport? Yeah. Well, and which, and which administration that was Marcel by then, or is that still out? No, it. Uh, uh, everybody has mentors, and everybody has good timing, mm -hmm. uh, or at least timing, and it's mm -hmm. so such a factor. Uh, Mayor Allen had an administrative assistant, as it was called in those days, named Earl Landers. He was a former chief administrator, he was a former uh, uh, controller, they call it, or commissioner of finance, we call now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mayor Allen hired him because of the mayor, Mayor Allen said, I don't know anything about being a mayor. I was a businessman. I was in the office of supply business. And uh, he was uh, like, he was chamber the chamber president in 1961, and uh, uh, he and uh, uh, Judge Walden mm -hmm. had negotiated a uh, an agreement uh, as he being the head of the chamber and Judge Walden being leader of the African American community in Atlanta, had negotiated an agreement to segregate the department stores, lunch counters, in uh, downtown Atlanta. And as such, Mayor Allen came to uh, be viewed as a potential political candidate. And uh, so he became mayor, and one of his first acts was to try to get uh, Mr. Landers to come and work with him. Well, I came to know Mr. Landers, who was just as much a gentleman as Mayor Allen was. He was uh, just a a wonderful man, highly respected, and uh, he became someone that I wanted to emulate. And uh, and anyway, I, I transferred to, fin the, to the finance department. And in that, in coming up through the ranks of the finance department, I became responsible for the accounting for federal grants. I was going to the Georgia State University at night studying accounting and I was placed in charge of accounting for federal grants which was a fairly minor deal in those days. Well, Mayor Allen was the first mayor, the only mayor, not only of any southern city, but the only mayor to go to Washington in 1964 and 65 to testify for the Civil Rights, the Voting Rights Act, the Public Accommodations Act. And uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was president at that time. And I've always assumed, without any direct evidence, that President Johnson said to his cabinet, I want you to have a grant ready for the city of Atlanta when you ask for it. We would get calls saying, we've got a $3 million grant up here for you. Have an application in by next Friday. <laughs> and we would, we would work all night and on weekends to write up this application for, for some worthy cause that we thought the city needed and get it up to Washington and 
in a few days we would have a check. And fairly soon, this young 30-year-old accountant in the finance department was running a budget about the size of the Atlanta General Fund. And the mayors and the city council members had to come to me to see if they could do this or if they could do that with the proceeds of these federal funds. And so that was a simply the luck of timing, so to speak. And it's really how I came to the attention of Mayor Allen and later Mayor Massell, who at that time was the vice mayor of the city, a, a position that we now call president of the city council. And, uh, and it sort of set my career on an upward tack, if you will. And uh, I, I, uh, uh, when, when, the, when Mayor Allen, in his last several years of his term, we're talking now 68 and 69, he reorganized the mayor's office. The mayor's office up in that time, up until that time, it consisted only of secretaries and a personal aide and driver and and some uh, and, uh, and Mr. Landers but it was reorganized to uh, make a position called the chief administrative officer and then there was a deputy chief administrative officer and several other staff members and Dan Sweat a familiar name to mm -hmm. old time Atlantans and Georgia State people good friend was uh, named the first chief administrative officer and I was the deputy chief administrative officer. Dan always said he needed somebody to know where the money was hidden up in the mm -hmm. finance department. And uh, so that that allowed me to work directly with Mayor Allen the last uh, couple of years of his administration, which was a great experience. Mayor Allen was a great leader. He was, he was his uh, training in business uh, gave him the executive uh, skills to be able to delegate, be able to set goals, and to uh, inspire people to meet, reach those goals. And uh, I, to this very day, uh, use things I've learned from him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, for instance, he, he, he used to tell us that he'd say, now I want to hold this meeting in a phone booth, or I want to hold this meeting in the stadium. And what he meant by that was that if he wanted uh, to really uh, support something and show that uh, that the people supported it, he wanted it. He wanted the meeting to be held in a room where it would appear there was a crowd uh, that would be in support of this. On the other hand, if he wanted to kill something or discourage something or to keep something from happening, he wanted it held in a big room so that the people there looked. <laughs> lost and it looked like there were very few people there and invariably the press the next morning would say an overflow crowd <laughs> or a sparse crowd it was uh, always amazing that it continued to work you know uh, every time it was done and uh, and it's something that I used uh, throughout my public career that I learned from him but that was a very small a very small thing but uh, in any event, uh, Mayor Allen went out of office in, uh, uh, at the end of, uh, of 1969 or the beginning of uh, 1968. Uh, the the uh, next election was held in the fall of 1969. Uh, very unusual uh, election. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the coalition of business people and other leadership uh, uh, supported uh, uh, Rodney Cook, a, who was a member of the city council. But Sam Massell uh, was able to put a coalition together made up mainly of the African American African American community and the beginning parts of the neighborhood movement and so forth. And he he won the office and. Uh, Dan left to become head of the, what is now the Atlanta Regional Commission. And Mayor Massell named me his chief administrative officer. So I was his chief administrative officer during most of his term in office, which was an exciting time. 
it was a time of Marta and mm -hmm. the Omni. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always thought that Mayor Marcel was a very uh, underestimated mayor. Mm -hmm. That uh, he was he's a very smart man and uh, he was detail oriented, sometimes too detail oriented. I never will forget a memo we got from him as to where to place the paper clip Hmm. on papers that you were filing. You wanted it to be placed at the bottom so that it did not fall off. And, so and, he, uh, and I've told a story in public on him that uh, he had this sense of humor that was uh, basically a little off center. He, we, we bought him once during water, I think it was during the Watergate hearings when uh, these uh, what do you call these machines where you put a piece of paper in and it grinds it up? Uh, Shredder. Shredders. Shredders came into in prominence. And nothing would do but they would order a shredder for him, and we did, and, and he was playing with it, and we were all, you know, going in and watching it, feeding it a piece of paper and watching it grind it up. And he put out a memo, and he said, now, uh, you must always make a copy of anything that you put through the shredder <laughs> first. And we, I remember we all looked at this memo and shaking our heads and finally figured out that it was a far-fetched joke on his part. <laughs> so anyway, it was a lot of fun and, and, and Mayor Marcel was a, was a great mayor. I, as, as all the mayors I worked for were great mayors. It was, it was a, a true blessing to, to be able to work for them. Uh, was the, the Marta, um, now he got he inherited Marta after there had been a failed yes, referendum. Yes, the first Marta referendum failed, and it was based on instead of a sales tax, it was based on a property tax, mm -hmm. and people voted it down. Mm -hmm. And the the Marta the Marta uh, proposal was very, it was a well thought out political compromise, the east-west and the north-south line, and the, and the spur to the Bankhead uh, Court's apartments, and uh, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a political coalition. And, uh, and the sales tax uh, was, was uh, less painful mm -hmm. than the property tax. Uh, Mayor Marcel, by the way, had this idea which I've often thought and wondered uh, what would have happened had it been followed. He thought that MARTA should be a no fare system. Hmm. He said he said that the transportation, the public transportation in a city, should be the same as an elevator in a high rise building. That it came along with the rent. And and that there should be no fare. And he compromised on 15 cents. When, when Marta first started, the fare was 15 cents. And uh, now it's what? It's nearly two dollars, right? Right. So I've often wondered uh, what, what, what we were we would be if we had stayed with his philosophy uh, mm -hmm. in that respect. So the, he thought that for the whole system for, or just the trains? No, the whole system. The whole system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember that 15 cent fare was great. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I, you know. Yeah. Because it was just not, you, right. there was no competition then between right. riding the bus or. Uh, you know. One of the more prominent, powerful uh, elected leaders in town at that time and a great supporter of Mayor Marcel was Senator Leroy Johnson. And, uh, I'll never forget being at City Hall the night of the Marta referendum. And it was very close. It was exceedingly close. And uh, it was down to, you know, the final precincts. And we were all worried. And, and, uh, uh, and it happened that Senator Johnson was over at the courthouse where they were actually counting the ballots. We, or Sam, uh, Mayor Marcel and the rest of us on, on his staff, and we were over to City Hall. And we were getting reports from the courthouse, which we would mark on a board, and, and it was a rather tense time. And I'll never forget that Mayor Marcel, we, 
he looked around and saw Senator Johnson coming up the steps. And he said, call a press conference, we've won. Because he knew that Senator Johnson wouldn't be coming over to participate in the announcement. <laughs> He, he would not have seen Senator Johnson <laughs> if we had lost. But he said, call a press conference. The minute he saw Senator Johnson coming up those steps, I remember he said, call a press conference. We've won. And uh, that was a, it was a great night. And, uh, and who were some of the key people put, sort of that kind of put the package together to sort of present it? Well, uh, that would be hard for me to remember. Uh, I, I remember that Senator Johnson was, in, was heavily in, in, involved. And it was, uh, you, you had to get the support of DeKalb County, and we had hoped Gwinnett, mm -hmm. and uh, you had to get the support of, obviously, Fulton County, and the city of Atlanta, and we had hoped Clayton. Mm -hmm. uh, Clayton and Gwinnett wound up voting against it and were not involved. The, it had to be a, a, a racial compromise because the east-west line basically served the African-American communities north-south line uh, was basically one through white communities and it, it was a it was a very delicately balanced uh, uh, proposal and uh, I, you know I, I, I really can't answer your question it was almost anybody who was anybody was involved mm -hmm. and uh, because we knew that this was basically the last shot We'd lost, we'd lost the referendum on the property tax idea, and if we didn't win it on the sales tax, we, we probably would not uh, mm -hmm. be involved. Uh, Mayor Allen, by the way, uh, when he became the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce in 1961, he announced a platform, a, a goal, a set of goals that he wanted to accomplish as head of the Chamber of Commerce for the year 1961. That became his platform for mayor uh, in the election later that year when Mayor Hartsfield decided to retire after being in the office over 23 years. And when, uh, when Mayor Allen uh, set up his campaign, this was his platform. He said, we have to support the public schools. Uh, you got to remember at that time, the governor of the state had made an announcement that the schools were to be closed. And the Sibley Commission uh, mm -hmm. went about the state holding public hearings to give him some cover to change his mind. Mm -hmm. And so it was a hot issue in 61. You have to remember that. Mm -hmm. It sounds, sounds literally crazy today that that <laughs> no, was <not> really. <laughs> that that was an issue but yeah. so anyway his big thing was to support the public schools and mm -hmm. keep the schools open mm -hmm. step up the tempo of construction of the expressways uh, you know there were little sections of the expressway system that were incomplete at that time if you wanted to come into town you came in on a section of of the interstate and then you had to get off and go down Cortland Street and and uh, and uh, so the connect. So the downtown connector wasn't finished. No, no, it was not. And urban renewal, urban renewal has gotten a, certainly a bad name over the years. But as you look around Atlanta today, uh, uh, everything from where the original convention hotel, which is the old Marriott now, I think it's a Sheridan built on urban renewal property. The Atlanta Civic Center was built on the area of some of the worst slums that I had ever seen. It was shocking to go over there. Uh, and the big urban renewal, the big uh, public housing projects that we've now decided are disasters and are tearing down, at that time they were a tremendous improvement mm -hmm. over sewer sewage running in the street and and houses with windows broken out. Auditorium, Coliseum, Stadium. Uh, we had been talked about for years, and nothing had been done about them. Forward Atlanta, which was the uh, uh, advertising to try to make Atlanta the 
major regional city in the southeast. And then finally, rapid transit. So it's surprising to me when you go back and look at how much of the Atlanta that we see today mm -hmm. is embodied by these six points that formed the basis of, of Mayor Allen's campaign. So one of the f things about looking back at it, the four mayors that I worked for, they all basically pushed this program of progressive, growth-oriented improvements, every one of them. Uh, and they, it was and initiated back with, uh, with uh, Mayor Allen. So uh, after Marcel, excuse the digressions. No, these are good. These are this uh, is really great information. I'd gotten to know this uh, new uh, president of the city council. He, uh, he, he, his, he had charisma written all over him. Nobody had ever seen a more naturally eloquent young man. And I say young because he was roughly my age mm -hmm. at the time. He was, he was always in demand. All, he, he, he's all those things that you struggle, everybody struggles to describe, and nobody really can. Maynard Jackson. He, uh, 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 I was, I, when, when Mayor Allen and Mayor Massell were mayor, we would get our daily mail at the mayor's office in a, one of those postal boxes, you know, that the postman would come up the steps with holding this sort of standard size box. And that was the daily mail that we got when, before Maynard became mayor. After he became mayor, the mail came in these big duffel bags, mm -hmm. sometimes two and three mm -hmm. at a time. Mm -hmm. and, and he would go make a speech, particularly at a college, and we would get a hundred, a thousand resumes from mm. young people wanting to work for this guy, wanting to be near him, wanting just to touch his garment. You know, I mean, it was mm. just, uh, it, was a, it was an amazing thing to me. But Mayor Jackson, looking at Massell's vote figures uh, for the 1969 campaign and looking at the demographics of the city as they were changing at that time, said, I can win this, mm -hmm. and he did. And uh, it was painful to Mayor myself, I can tell you, because I saw it close up, that people who had supported him four years early. But I think it finally dawned on him and, and all of us that uh, the African-American community of Atlanta, having never approached political power during the Jim Crow era, to have it within their grasp and to, to be able to see it mm -hmm. and to be believe that it was possible. I mean, who could blame them? Mm -hmm. And uh, so they voted out a good man and voted in a good man mm -hmm. is the way mm -hmm. I have always mm -hmm. looked at it. And uh, working for Maynard was a trip. He was, <laughs> he was uh, in the years that I knew him, he was a straight, he was almost a 19th century or 18th century uh, sense of honor. Mm. He it just when it was just me and and him in the office, and I would suggest, you know, as a bureaucrat or somebody trying to get something done, I would suggest maybe cutting this corner. He could he could actually expand himself. He could he could actually become even bigger than he was. <laughs> and he would say, I am not going to do that. I'm here to represent the people. And I would, you know, I would, I'd want to say, wait a minute, it's just you and me, you know, here in the room. You don't, you don't have to 
make this speech, you know. But that's that's the way he was. He was uh, he he had this. Uh, I mean, it would not have shocked me in those days if he had challenged somebody to a duel. Almost, you know, he was just he was just uh, that way. And uh, and and truly a great heart, and uh, truly a great loss to the city. And then, and I think about him. I think about him often. And uh, and he, in uh, his latter uh, uh, term, uh, brings me to the airport. I was I was his chief administrative officer, continuing on uh, after myself. Actually, there was a small uh, gap in my service where I had left for a year or so after he, immediately after he was elected, but then he asked me to come back, which I did, and he appointed me as chief administrative officer. And then the airport, by this time, was getting in a real crisis situation. And uh, everybody knew the economic impact that it had on the city and, uh, and realized that, uh, that if we didn't move and move aggressively that we very well might lose this great connecting hub that we had that employed so many people that made possible the convention industry which had become such a vital part of, of Atlanta. And, uh, but it had trouble getting started as any major public project does, had a lot of controversy. Uh, one of those, and the one that gets the most attention is that Mayor Jackson ruled, or he, he I guess that's a good another word as any, ruled that 20% uh, of the construction activity would go to minority-owned firms. Well, this was unheard of, and uh, it created a tremendous uh, amount of consternation among the traditional construction industry here in town. And, uh, and we were, in fact, on some uncharted legal grounds. And, and, uh, and a number of people not I, because I knew better. But a number of people went to Maynard and tried to talk him out of it, try to say, hey, you know, really, you know, uh, you can't be serious, so forth. But they found out pretty quick that he was serious. As a matter of fact, his favorite expression was, you tell them that weeds will grow if 20% of this construction does not go to minority firms, meaning that you may sue me, you may keep me from being able to do this, but there's no law says that we have to build the new terminal. Mm -hmm. So we will not build it, no matter the consequences. So I was the one that went to the major construction firms, which are so many of the leaders of Atlanta at that time, the Beers Construction, Mr. Gellerstead, and Suit, and you can tie us up for years, maybe. Uh, or you can say, having 20% of a $500 million construction program, having 80% of, of that mm -hmm. is better than having 100% of nothing. Mm -hmm. And to their credit, they, they finally agreed that that was that that was the case. And uh, so you had to be you were the bearer of that message. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which uh, which and I got the scars to prove it. <laughs> but uh, but they what needs to be said there is that while they they had real serious doubts as to whether this could realistically be done, they were interested in the future of the city. Mm -hmm. And they could see that that uh, they had to do this mm -hmm. or something bad was going to happen to the city. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it was better to agree to it. The FAA turned out to be a, a, a somewhat of a, a, a problem because they had to, their rule before granting any federal money was that it had to, everything had to be competitively bid and the low bid had to be accepted. Well, 
you let a contract and a low bidder gets it and he says you take your 20 percent and you know what you can do with that mm -hmm. so what would we what would we to do if that were the case so we devised a pre-qualification system in other words we mm -hmm. we we told the uh, contractors that you have to become pre-qualified to bid and as part of the pre-qualification process you have to tell us how you're going to reach the 20 percent goal mm -hmm. and then we had a bidding process between those people who had pre-qualified mm -hmm. so we met the FAA's requirement and then when they the low bidder won we simply incorporated his voluntary program to reach the 20 percent goal into his contract mm -hmm. and it became thereby enforceable according to our attorneys so that's just sort of one of the examples of what we had to go through to get all this So done. was that a new thing? Yes, it was. Absolutely a new thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, at one time we were accounting for over 90% of all the minority uh, contracting that the FAA was supporting nationwide hmm. here in this one project in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 minority participation hadn't been taken all that seriously mm -hmm. up to that point. Mm -hmm. And it's a great uh, legacy of Maynard Jackson that he that he, he provided the leadership mm -hmm. mainly by saying this has to be done, period. Mm -hmm. No no excuses, no backing up, mm -hmm. no compromises. This has to be done. Now you guys that I've hired and appointed, you go figure out a way to mm -hmm. get it done. Mm -hmm. And we did it. Now, I'd be the first to admit that we made a few mistakes. We we. We, we policed it as best we could, but we, on occasion we would find somebody who was a minority partner in, you know, trucking or paving or excavation or whatever, who was not actively participating in the job. He was sitting in the back of his office getting a check, and we would immediately stop that contract, mm -hmm. end it, you know, and say this is, you know, this is not how it's supposed to work, and you're and so forth. But in the main, it worked. In the main, it worked. And it was certainly done with the best, the best of intentions and, and so forth. So we, so we got it done, and the project was held up all over the nation as, uh, as, uh, and, and Maynard listed it as one of his greatest accomplishments, which he should have. And, and the, the pre-certification um, idea, was that, was that a new one in, in Atlanta? Or was it, yeah, it, uh, I'm not, qualified. yeah, I'm not, I'm, you, would, you would always uh, have standards for bidders mm -hmm. in saying that they had to reach certain uh, economic mm -hmm. uh, strength, in other words, they had to have the strength, the, the financial mm -hmm. strength to, to do the job, they had to be able to get bonds and so forth and so on. So in a sense, you always had, there was always some pre some qualification for mm -hmm. bidding. Mm -hmm. This is the first time pre-qualification had been done for minority participation. Mm -hmm. And it, and we did the same thing on concessions, which is one of my greatest failures. I was one of the fathers of this. It, concessions at the airport were a burden of the worst sort. You were out there trying to build this great facility. You were out there trying to run this great facility, employing Thirty to 50,000 people, now it's some over 50 now, it was 35 when I was there. And you'd, be, you'd find yourself spending half your days, half your time on who was selling the hot dogs or who was, you know, and it was just, it became just, it was just an awful thing and, and uh, unsavory. I mean, you know, this, this, everybody had a, you know, you'd speak to the average citizen and you'd, you'd assume that crookiness was going on, you know. And so we came up with a master concessionaire. Mm -hmm. We did it in exactly the same way we did the construction. We said, in order to bid, you've got to have a minority partner. It's got to, a minority partner has to be responsible for 25%, I think, at that time of the concession business. And, and you have all 100, when the terminal first opened, it was 100,000 square feet of concession space. You've got the rights to all that space. We're going to do the bid on a totally quantitative basis. Who bids the most money for a 10-year contract? You handle it. You manage it. The city's not involved. 
and it failed. And it failed because the day after the contract was let, the concessionaires were in the mayor's office and in the city council member's office trying to get more space, lower rent, better location. They were lobbying all the time. And uh, they basically were able to take apart that <coughs> they didn't maintain the, uh, the discipline. And to this very day, as we speak here on July the 26th, 2011, there are still controversies going on at the airport about airport concessions. It's, a, it's just, a, I, 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 I had thought that, that you could list this as one of my failures because I was the father of this and I was the one who pushed it. And it was a bitter disappointment to me that it didn't work. And it was considered one of my failures as, as an airport so, administrator. So the, the idea was that the all of the sub-concessionaires would deal only with, with this master concessionaire. Master concessionaire. Who, that was Dobbs Pascal originally? It was, yeah. And and not, and so then we came into everybody trying to unravel yeah. it and get yeah. pressure from City yeah. Hall exactly. onto Dobbs Pascal. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and first thing you know, they were giving contracts to the people who had only mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. uh, only political qualifications. They, they had never run a concessionaire, a restaurant, or anything before in their lives. And they're not bad people, I suppose, but it would, the airport would be better off if, if they didn't have to deal with the concession business. It's, uh, it's just an unfortunate, unfortunate thing. Well, after the uh, after the terminal was done, we spent $500 million. We brought it in under budget and uh, and of course I can tell you I can say now while I always bragged about it being under budget uh, under the city system you have to have all the money in the bank before you let a contract mm -hmm. so we had to borrow uh, I think our first bond issue was 329 million dollars as I remember and I remember the uh, interest rate was 6.5 percent we issued these bonds and agreed to pay this interest rate and then uh, this is, uh, we're talking late 70s now, Mayor, I mean, uh, Governor Carter had become president. And uh, we went through an economic crisis, if you'll remember, mm -hmm. where interest rates went out of the roof. The prime rate went to 21%. Mm -hmm. And uh, so remember now, we're sitting here with all this money. We're paying it out over a period of three years. But we had to have the money in the bank before we let the contract. So we're sitting there. And we invest this money at interest rates that were... So during the time of construction of that terminal, we earned over $50 million in interest. Hmm. And as a result, we were able to cover every mistake, every change order we had to make, every, you know... So, again, going back to my issue about timing, it's uh, very important in one's career. <laughs> and, and, and schedule, you know, when you say, well, we're on it ahead of schedule. Well, I had done a lot of, I had worked in the city doing, handling some fairly big construction projects even before that. And I knew that you take whatever they estimate the time is and you add sufficient time that, you know, to uh, account for all the delays and so forth. So that's what I did in that case. So I padded, I padded the, the time <laughs> budget, and I was lucky with respect to interest on construction, so I was able to brag that we brought it in under budget and, under, and before, earlier than scheduled. So it, uh, and it turned out it's, it's the terminal that we use out there today. and. Uh, it, it's interesting that every uh, new airport been, that has been built, and there have been very few, Denver, uh, Hong Kong come to mind, they've always all been built on that model. At, uh, the, the, uh, our, we had a director of planning, a uh, fellow named Max Walker, who was very good. And uh, I remember him telling me one day that uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, which had just opened, and it had been our basic model. And we were going to have a Delta terminal with a, with a 
interstate highway running down the middle, and we would have the Delta Terminal at that time, the Eastern Terminal, and the other terminals, you know. And that's the Dallas Fort Worth model. It had opened. Max Walker is his name. He'd gone out there to look at it, and he came back and he said, We can't do it. And he said, uh, It's not built for connecting traffic. We will have a disaster on our hands. So, what to do? And he said, What we need is a high rise building laid on its side. The floors are here, and we have a he said a horizontal elevator, which is a contradiction in terms, right? Mm -hmm. He said we need a horizontal elevator serving the four floors. So if you look at the terminal from the top, from the, from the air, you see the five, now five, and soon to be six concourses with the new international terminal. And then you have the elevator, people mover running between them. And uh, that's Denver's model, and it's Hong Kong's model. So it uh, it is it's still working today, 30 years later. The old terminal that you're thinking of, Andrew, the the uh, blue mm -hmm. turquoise with a barrel roof, mm -hmm. with the two arms going two arms going, going out, it. yeah, and all that walking and so forth. <laughs> that terminal opened in 1961, and it was closed in uh, 1980. So. It, it served us for 19 years, and just past the 30th anniversary. Mm -hmm. the, this terminal opened in September of 1980, mm -hmm. and we I went out for a little ceremony on the 30th anniversary of this terminal, and mm -hmm. it's still functioning and still working. So we were all proud of it. We were all proud of it because we, the four of us, Max Walker, Richard Stockner. Uh, Myself and Calvin Carter mm -hmm. were the four-member team that was out there uh, mm -hmm. doing it, and then we're all thankfully still alive. And we're all out there in September to mm -hmm. recognize the 30th. Well, the terminal was done, and uh, it was uh, it was some like everything else is sort of anticlimactic. Something that you had spent, you know, years. Long hours, weekends, no vacations, getting done. It's sort of anticlimactic. I went over there to that old terminal the day or two afterwards and uh, walked through it, and it was surreal. Mm. It was empty. It had been such a busy place. And uh, But what I remember was I heard music. Music was playing. And I came back. To the office, and I said, "What's with the music?" And one of the guys says, "That's Muzak." I said, "Well, how come I've never heard it before?" Well, the paging system in the terminal overrode the Muzak, mm -hmm. and it was so busy. The paging system was so busy mm -hmm. that you never. We've been paying for it for years, <laughs> and, and, and nobody had ever heard it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and and uh, later we had to we blew up the old terminal. I tried to. I, it was my thought again that we could find a use for it. I was I was thinking about some kind of uh, international merchandise mart or mm -hmm. something. That, uh, but uh, and it was too expensive to keep up, so we imploded it. But I went over there a few weeks before that was done with a crew and liberated or stole a keepsake out of the out of the lobby. You remember me telling you going into the airport and mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. making trying mm -hmm. to make a call. Yeah. Well I've got a phone booth huh. from uh, from the old terminal which I now have in the store in the storeroom because I don't have room for it in our little house that we have now on the farm, but but it, every time I see it, you know, I think about the opportunity that that facility gave me, you know, some, some hillbilly kid from the mountains, you know, who, who uh, never would, would never have amounted to anything, hardly, if, uh, if it had not been for that 
for that place. So I'll treasure that. Too. And it still works on a dime, by the way. It, I mean, it did. Well, I had it in my house here in Atlanta, and it's still, you put in a dime, and you, you can make a call, but uh, but not. I don't have it hooked up now. So anyway, after the terminal was open, and uh, uh, you know, I I guess I, I was like everybody else who goes through a major a major thing like that. Do you feel a sort of a letdown? And and uh, Governor Joe Frank Harris had just gotten elected governor, and uh, he. Uh, and I, I think the, I think the election was held in the fall of '82, and uh, he I saw him one day. He was at the airport making, uh, or he was at the he was at a function around the airport at one of the airport hotels making a speech. And somehow the conversation led to what are what are you thinking about? I mean, what are you doing? And what are you know? And I said, well, you know, I'm still not old. At that time, I was, I have to figure it up. I, was, <laughs> I guess I was coming up on 50 or something, midlife crisis probably. And uh, he said, would you be in, interested in the Department of Industry and Trade, as it was then called? And I said, I, I, said, I think I would. And uh, this was during Mayor Young's first mm -hmm. term. And uh, I was excited about his term. He was an international celebrity, you know, and uh, we, he, uh, <laughs> I tell you, I, I'm telling you these little bitty small things about these great leaders, which, you know, they, they always, they're fun to me to remember, so. Uh, I, I, my recollection is that it was his first day as mayor, and I could be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the archives hold, hold his. Uh, his, his calendar, but it seems to me like it was his first day. And he asked to see me that morning. And I mean, I was, I was elated because, you know, here I was going to be one of the first department heads that he wanted to meet with. So I assumed that it was about something, you know, really important and what kind of major role that I was going to be playing in his administration, you know. So I get down there to the mayor's office, and they usher me in. And after a little, a little bit of small talk, he's, he says, I never know what time it is at the airport. <laughs> and I, I said to the, you know, I think I said, I beg your pardon, nurse. <laughs> he says, there are not enough clocks <laughs> in the airport. And I said, well, I said, well, we can take care of that, you know. And then I waited, you know, for the real reason that I was there. And it turned out that was the real reason. <laughs> that was the real reason I was there. So I go back to the airport and I get the people together and I say, we got to, I said, I said, I, we got to have more clocks. I said, I want a lot of clocks. I said, I don't want you to be anywhere in this airport that you can't see a clock. Well, the guys come back to me and say, well, you know, it's going to cost this much money and uh, we've got to wire, it's going to take time because we've got to wire them all up so that they all say the same, mm -hmm. you know, they all are on the same minute. And I said, you know, to heck with that. I said, we've got to have clocks now. So we go off and buy hundreds, I think, of these, these quartz uh, clocks run by batteries. Mm -hmm. And for years later, I mean, I was no longer at the airport, I'd be out there and there'd be some guy climbing a ladder to <laughs> replace the batteries in these stupid clocks. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, those are the Andy Young, <laughs> those are the Andy Young clocks. And uh, that he, he evidently had been a pet peeve of his, I guess, that if he ever said, now, if I'm mayor, I'm going to... And he was always on my case about uh, trying to uh, do things in the airport that would play up Atlanta. That would show, he said, I remember him telling me one time, when I go to Peoria, there's a bulldozer, a caterpillar bulldozer sitting in the airport. So, you know, when you go to Peoria, you know, you're in the place where caterpillar tractors are, are, uh, are done. And uh, I don't recall what we did in reaction to that, but 
it's probably a good idea because it, the airport was sort of bland, you know. Mm -hmm. It was sort of we 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 would not spend a lot of money on on uh, things like that. So anyway, but uh, and then and then he he showed a side which to a to a manager was was uh, but as I grow older, I grow to appreciate more. We caught, I remember we caught some guys stealing. We caught them red-handed. They, the they were airport maintenance employees and they were carrying batteries out of the maintenance facility uh, to their cars. And, uh, and I immediately fired them. I fired them all. I think there were three of them. And within a matter of hours, uh, Mayor Young was on the phone to me. So now, you know, you know, suspend them for a few days or something, but put them back on the payroll. I said, Mr. Mayor, you know, we, they can't, we, we, we can't be having people that steal around here, you know. He said, ah, but I understand. But he said, they got families and they got children. So, you know, slap their hands, but put them back on the payroll, you know. So, you know, I was thinking, I said, man, we got to, he's a minister, he, at heart, he's a minister. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what he is. And of course, I, as well, I was irritated at the time, like I say, as time goes on, I think I'd rather be remembered as someone who showed some mercy as opposed to someone who put them out on the street. So, he was a, he, was a, he, he, he as I said, I, I, I've been particularly blessed, I mean, to have worked for these four men and even, I would include even Governor Harris in this, who I work for in the state. I mean, I could have worked for crooks. I could have worked for people who are less committed uh, to this city and to this state. But it, it became my great good luck for me to have worked for these these men who uh, who I can admire unreservedly. And uh, it's just been a blessing to be able to, to do that. I've thought about uh, the role that I have played in life at this stage of, at my age now, and looking back. And uh, uh, we can end on this unless you've got questions. Uh, for some reason, which cannot be explained by family, or circumstances in which I grew up. I became sort of a bookworm as a kid, and in my setting that was considered odd. Uh, but one thing that I got really interested in was why we were so poor, poor as a people. Uh, I, and I think one of the reasons is, is I grew up next to North Carolina. In other words, we could drive just a short distance and be in North Carolina. North Carolina was a progressive state. Mm -hmm. They had good roads. They had good schools. Somehow or another, you just, when you crossed the state line, you know, things just looked more prosperous. And here I was in this little mountain a county with poverty that was so grinding and so bad that it, and I had read enough to know that that, was not the way it had to be. Not only that, I had gotten interested in the so-called New South movement. That uh, that we were we were being led by demagogues mm -hmm. at that time in this state, but yet there were people who who advised us and told us and spoke out and saying it does not have to be this way. James Jimmy Carmichael ran mm -hmm. for governor in 1946 against Eugene Talmadge and this was his campaign. And uh, and I, I became a, a, a virulent, he's, as a boy, an anti-Talmadge person. Herman Talmadge came to my town in 1948. He was running for governor against Emmy Thompson. Mm -hmm. This is in the wake of the three governors controversy where uh, Thompson was serving two years before he had to run again. And uh, 
and Talmadge, you know, backed up his truck uh, to our town square and he harangued us for an hour, mainly about the Negro issue, as put it, and which was sort of puzzling to us because I grew up in a county that had no African Americans at all. Zero. Mm -hmm. I had never seen a black person close up. Mm -hmm. But here he was telling me what a disaster it was going to be if you know a black child went to school with a white child and so forth. And uh, I'll never forget him saying that the greatest challenge facing us as a people is maintaining our way of life. The greatest challenge that we face is maintaining our way of life. Well, I looked around, I looked around the, at the people gathered there that day. There were still people with their horse and wagons. Now, this is 48. Uh, I don't know, did you, were you born in Thomasville? Or? I was born in Thomasville. Well, yeah. you, you, you can identify with what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. They were poor, undernourished uh, people, ignorant. And, and even then I knew as a boy that the, our way of life is poverty and ignorance. Mm -hmm. And our greatest mm -hmm. challenge is to maintain mm -hmm. that way of life. It, this got me excited about Ivan Allen, you know, with his six points, because I recognized him as being a, as being a, a one of the proponents of the, of the New South movement that uh, we could do better. And when I look back from this vantage point, it seems to me that everything I did was along that line. That my service with the city. You know, was basically helping build a brave and beautiful city that Henry Grady talked about. That uh, I'm not sure I did it with any conscious thought at the time that that's what I was doing. But I think when Governor Harris said to me, "Would you be interested in the Department of Industry and Trade?" That was just promoting economic development. Mm -hmm. That was simply selling what I had been doing. And it seemed to me the, a continuation of the same, of the same uh, thing that I had been accomplishing. And uh, so I, you know, I would like to think. I mean, I have not played the role that Andy Young has played, or Maynard Jackson, or Sam Cell, or Ivan Allen. But in a very junior and <laughs> bush league way, just to have been able to add a shovelful to to that effort which we, while well, we've made tremendous progress from that moment in 1948 when I heard that speech today, it seemed like a different, totally different world. And uh, calls me that in recent years after making tremendous progress toward the equal per capita income with the rest of the nation that we've been begin to relapse mm -hmm. some. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a piece for Georgia Trend back in January on this issue. Mm -hmm. that. Uh, that for almost 40 years, starting with Governor Sanders, as uh, Jack English was talking about on the elevator coming up, that Carl Sanders was our first New South governor, mm -hmm. basically. And we had much of the progress that we have started with him and Ivan Allen. Ivan Allen being mayor and he being governor. Mm -hmm. Been continued by all these people that we've just been talking about, including Andrew Young. And back into the 80 percentile from the 95 percentile that we reached in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. But that's a matter of great concern to me, mm -hmm. that uh, after all this effort, you know, after all this trouble, and after all this, after all the fights that we fought, and uh, to be lapsing back is uh, hard for me to accept. ask one question that's perhaps speculation, but it appears to me that we're at a critical juncture where the airport, 
may be approaching its maximum capacity. There's a lot of discussion once again about a second airport. At the same time, we had an effort back a decade or so ago to move from a transportation-based city to a communication. We were going to be the fiber optic cable city. And that no one talks about the importance of that. And yet trains now re-enter the picture with Charlotte and North Carolina nosing out Georgia and Atlanta as a transit-oriented uh, development strategy based on trains. If we're faced with very difficult policy choices among communication technology, air traffic, or trains, what advice would you give us as we try and grapple with these kinds of alternatives? Uh, do we try and do all three? Should we be uh, looking at more runway capacity at the existing airport? What You know as much about this as probably anybody <laughs> we're likely yeah. to talk to. Uh, well, I'm always surprised by, by developments, but uh, the um, maximization of Hartsfield has always been our watchword. You know, you maximize it, and they are talking about a sixth runway. And uh, the the hub status is something to be guarded jealously because of uh, uh, jobs that are dependent upon the hub status. There are those who say, well, just start discouraging the hub status and make room for O and D or originating departing passengers. But you know, while that may make some sense, if you just isolate the efficiency of air transportation, it doesn't make any sense when you consider the state and city as a whole with, you know, probably two or three hundred thousand jobs either being directly or indirectly uh, uh, dependent upon air transportation. So I believe we, number one, we, we defend the hub system and it does not have to be at the expense of any other strategy with respect to tra uh, the information technology, which is taken off one of the great legacies of the Olympics, for which Mayor Young was, in, was involved in, is the uh, transportation, I mean, the, uh, the information technology infrastructure that it left us with. And uh, there, I had a company, a major payment processing company located at the Inforum Forum recently, big operation, and they're there because of the Technology where the Atlanta organizing committee's offices were located, and that's what they're relying on. Uh, one little thing that should be in everybody's mind is uh, the current federal budget problems, which are now on the front burner up in Washington, and the uh, the winding down of at least uh, the two major wars, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, that uh, there's going to be tremendous pressure on the defense budget. And the next round of BRAC, Base Relocation mm -hmm. Closure Commission, uh, will bring some reexamination of uh, Dobbins Air Force Base. And uh, while Dobbins is limited, it can handle almost as many passengers as LaGuardia does at New York. And uh, it's the least costly of the alternatives for additional capacity. So if we have additional capacity, it will be at some existing facility. It will not be at some new greenfield. Uh, as to transportation generally, you know, which is our uh, steel if we were Pittsburgh or our gambling if we were Las Vegas or our sunshine if we were Miami Beach, uh, We've fallen behind the curve, both in uh, surface transportation and certainly in rail transportation. I think I think rail transportation is a given for the future. A tremendous cost and tremendous cost of operations. You need you need tremendous population densities to make it work, and uh, 
that's really where the successful train operations are. So it's, it, I, I, I don't see how local people and local governments can swing that. And that's the current problem is that the state is saying, and we've got federal money to build commuter rail, but you governments along the line have to chip in the money to operate it. Well, this is a budget backbreaker for most of those local governments. And until there is some substantial financial assistance, both in not only in construction but in operation, I, it's hard for me to see how it happens. But, but it is the future for intermediate and short-term travel. It never will be the solution to go into London or to Germany. And, of course, that is a major strategy for the future of the Atlanta airport is the international terminal. And, and we have done just exactly the right thing by making ourselves a international hub as we used to make ourselves a domestic hub. And that will help ensure the primacy, if you will, of our airport facilities. So, so uh, no, I don't have any quick answers to that. So. What, what other, how are your, um, how's your time? Because we're, we have. Yes, um, I, I have a wife who is said she can, she wanted to spend an hour and a half at Ikea. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's, I like her. <laughs> and that's uh, coming up right quick. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. if you don't mind. I mean, I, I love you all, but I love her more. Well, we, we, just, we appreciate that and respect that. And really appreciate your yeah. sharing that. Time with us today. Well, your dad has been very important to me and somebody I've admired greatly. So, whatever he needs from me, he's got.